Okay, it's a great pleasure to have with us Jeff Alman. Jeff is a faculty, and I think he's retired recently from Stanford. He's also the CEO of Radiance. Uh, there are very few in this room who probably haven't heard of Jeff or not known Jeff. He's one of the eminent computer scientists of our generation. He's one of those people who sort of took computer science from its infancy to what it is now, so blame him <laughs> if you want to. Yeah, his contributions to computer science has been captured in a variety of different things, not just his pioneering research, which he has done, but also in a huge number of books. I don't understand how he found time to write 16 different books. A lot of us have studied from his books, including myself. I think we learned databases, automata <coughs> theory, theory of computation, okay. compilers, algorithms, a lot of different things yeah, from yeah. Jeff's book. So VLSI. VLSI, the Nick is pointing out VLSI as well. So his impact on computer science has been absolutely fantastic. And its impact doesn't end from his pioneering research or his books, but probably equally importantly from his wonderful students he has produced, three of whom have been faculty with us uh, right here. And if you sort of start counting the next generation beyond his students, including his descendants, the list goes on. Yours truly, myself, and also one of his down the chain uh, to my advisor, uh, a descendant, academic descendant from Jeff as well. So his impact has been to, and if you sort of go, the interesting thing is this, if you think this is about UCI, if you go to any reasonable college or university all over the world, you probably, they can all sing the same story over and over again. So I think his impact to CS obviously <coughs> is, uh, is cannot be overstated. It's not gotten unnoticed. He has been awarded almost anything. I can if I sort of I need my cheat sheet for that, but if I sort of count the number of awards he's gotten from Sigma Contribution Awards, Innovation Award, IEEE Medal, uh, Von Neumann Medal, uh, Nuth Prize, uh, uh, the list goes on and on and on. So if I sort of go into that, I guess maybe he'll have no time for a talk, so I don't want that to happen. So I'll end here. Let's welcome Jeff. Uh, give him a very warm welcome to see. I put up the stage for Jeff. There are some seats here, the folks on the back. Wanna... Anyway, um, I, for the past couple of years, I've been on a, a, a an NRC panel uh, called the Data Science Education Roundtable. And uh, curiously, this is run not by the computer science wing of the National Research Council, but, but, um, but the statistics wing. And so, mo well, at least half of the people on this panel are statisticians. Uh, and it's enabled me to sort of see how statisticians think about data science. Uh, and to give you a hint, I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you why. Uh, sort of what part of the talk is about. So I'm asking a question, is data science real? Is it machine learning? Is it statistics? Uh, Answer is yes, no, no. Uh, to give you a hint. And um, I just because I don't want to give you a purely political talk, uh, I, I will try to spend about half the time talking about uh, some uh, algorithms that I think are an important part of, of the tools of data science uh, that are not machine learning and not, not really statistics. Um, OK, so to start, uh, way back in the year 2000, which by the way is when I, I did not retire recently. In 2002, um, uh, but um, when people start talking about data mining, this was the hot topic. Uh, and then by say 2010, uh, you couldn't be doing data mining anymore. You had to be doing big data. Okay. Now you got to do data science. Um, well, if you think about it. What you know? What what is really being talked about is you take the best stuff that computer science gives you, the, the, the best uh, the best hardware, uh, the the, uh, the best algorithms, uh, and, and the, uh, the most efficient uh, pro programming systems, and put them all together, and you use it to solve other people's problems. And, and that's great. I mean, that's, that's kind of what computer scientists do, most of us. Um, now, uh, again, data science is a product 
in academics, you know, it, uh, if you're in academia, uh, there, there is an advantage in terms of resources coming from the university to say that you're the ones doing data science. Okay. So uh, I've seen lots of people uh, you know, talk about data science as really machine learning. Um, again, the status, the, what, what I get from the statisticians is that it, it's, you know, that they own a, a data science. Um, uh, one of my colleagues in the statistics department at Stanford uh, and tried to uh, sort of stats claim to me that, um, that, that that data science is statistics done right. That's the way he put it. Uh, okay, well, uh, <coughs> again, in, in, in my view, data science is sort of what the database community and other communities in computer science have been doing all along, okay, which is um, uh, you know, trying to deal with the largest amounts of data that you can deal with in, in, in some reasonable way and do what you can to, uh, to, to apply it to solve people's problems. And uh, in particular, in terms of this data science education uh, the roundtable that I'm involved in, uh, my position, not shared by too many people, <coughs> is that the way you learn to do data science is you, you, you enroll in the computer science department, you take the regular, the core computer science, and you take the <coughs> courses that deal with large-scale data. Well, okay. Um, all right, so so here, here's the thing that, that, that absolutely drives me nuts. Uh, in this round table, at least three times speakers have show this diagram as an explanation of what data science is. Um, interesting is, we're, we're, um, I, I've also, in, in other interactions with statisticians, at least twice I've seen, again, this diagram is the explanation of, of data science as far as a statistician is concerned. Um, where did I get this, this from? Well, I, I just Googled data science Venn diagram. Turns out that there is a Wikipedia article <coughs> entitled Data Science Venn Diagrams. This is the first one. But there are a number of others uh, uh, put out by different, uh, different disciplines. And they're all just as self-serving as this one. And, and by the way, the next slide I'm going to give you uh, is my Venn Diagram, which also is self-serving. <laughs> uh, OK, so is it, does this make sense to everybody? You see how you got, you know, these three bubbles, hacking skills, math, that knowledge, and substantive expertise, and the intersection of all three is data science. Okay. Well, um, I don't really, I, actually, I think it's, com well, I think it's completely wrong. <coughs> okay, first of all, uh, I assume by substantive expertise, they mean, you know, domain knowledge. That is, uh, clearly data science does involve applications to something somebody else's uh, problem. Now, this, of course, really, you know, well, it's cool. who knows? Um, <laughs> it, it, it totally dismisses um, what computer science contributes, okay, which is it's not just hacking. And, and I, I consider hacking, a hacker is, is one of, you know, there's one of the, there's a small number of words if you are one, you can use it. If you're not, you can't. Okay. And uh, now it turns out Drew Conway, by the way, uh, when he did this diagram, was a uh, a, 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 a PhD student in political science <laughs> at, uh, at NYU. Um, but he says he has a an undergraduate degree in computer science, so I guess he was allowed to use the term. But but. But it's, it completely misrepresents what computer science brings to the table. But all the other positions are wrong, too. Okay. Um, okay. Well, okay, he says, <laughs> what, what he's saying here is, if you're trying to apply computer science to somebody's problem, but you are not under the wise guidance of a statistician, <laughs> then this is a danger. Okay, I'm going to argue uh, later on uh, by giving you one example 
uh, that data science really tends to operate in that area. Now, that's not to say, by the way, that, that statistics and mathematics don't inform a lot of the important algorithms that we use. It does. Okay, that's, uh, but, uh, but basically, we do the best we can. To, to, to solve people's problems. Um, now let's look at this first. Traditional research. Okay, what, what is traditional research? It's it, it somehow connecting statistics and mathematics to somebody's problem, but without writing any code. That's what that part of the, of the diagram says. Uh, now I don't know, you know, uh, it's not my tradition. I hope it's not yours, but maybe it's uh, maybe Drew thought that it was uh, somebody. Now look at where, where machine learning lies. Okay, it's applications of mathematics. It's, it's, it's basically implementing mathematics and statistics, but not applying it to anything. I don't think there are too many machine learning people who uh, who would um, uh, who would see it that. Okay, so here's here's how I would I would. Can you go back just one point? I want to get a picture of that. that uh, awesome. No, I'm, I'm gonna. Um, I, again, you you can Google you can Google. Uh, uh, I know, but I like your cutting a part of it. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, the slides are available. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, you, you can take take all the pictures you want, but you don't really need it. Um, but but sure. Um, okay. Anyway. So, in my view, okay, there's computer science and there's domain science. And the middle is, is sort of data science. Um, machine learning, uh, I see as a, is a part of data science, maybe not quite as big as that bubble shows. Um, some machine learning is the data science, uh, but there are, you know, machine learning is used in lots of other, you know, problems. Uh, driverless cars, uh, machine translation. So, you know, lot, lots, of, lot, lots of machine learning is used outside of data science. Now, where do uh, math and statistics fit in? Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, I, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, I, I never learned to, to draw anything but circles. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, in order, I just wanted to, to sort of and math, math and statistics, very important tools in developing algorithms. Uh, a lot of, you know, it applies to machine learning. Uh, it applies to a lot of other computer science as well. But it doesn't really deliver data science directly. It delivers it through the algorithm. That's, that's my, <coughs> my view. Is there any message in the color choice of circles? <laughs> no, not really. I, you know, again, I just pick random things from the palette. Uh, um, anyway, uh, okay. So let's, let's drill down a little bit into to, to, to what the statisticians are saying. Um, okay. First of all, so t again, I don't want to put down statisticians. They're, they're, they're very smart people. Uh, you know, they, they, they can do very good work. Uh, and, and in particular, in computer science, we need statistics in, um, you, know, for, you know, for example, an, an, well, analysis algorithms. Uh, uh, randomized algorithms are a very, very important field these days. Uh, I mean, most important algorithms that we use today are randomized in some sense. Uh, you do want to know that the algorithm works. You usually need statistical tools to, to, to prove that. And, and I'm, you know, I, I no, no question about that. But that's, again, that's statistics helping the world through computer science, not directly. Um, there are even certain applications where you need to, the, the, the result that you deliver has to, ha has to be checked for statistical validity. I mean, here's just an example. Um, when you're analyzing census data, uh, if, if you, you know, want to make a statement like this, 10% of the population is, is below the poverty line in this county or something. Um, uh, 
you know, there, there are constant, you, you really need to understand that that means, you know, between 9 and 11 percent, not between, you know, 2 and 98 percent or something. Uh, uh, you know, so, so, you know, there are applications where statistics uh, are important. Um, but here's, again, this, uh, I learned from, from this round table uh, that the, the, there's a, statisticians tend to have this fundamental attitude that data is to play with. Okay. Uh, they like to analyze it rather than solve people's problems. So uh, just, just for example, one of the, the, the sessions was devoted to a, um, a hackathon. The statisticians run a, a, what they call a hackathon. Students, uh, they, they're given 48 hours, um, and apparently come from all over the world uh, to, to, to compete in this. They give them 48 hours, sleep is optional. Uh, they give them a big data set, and um, they're asked to find something interesting in the data. And there are judges who sort of judge this sort of the way you judge um, ice dancing or something. <laughs> uh, you know, he said, gee, this is more interesting than that. You know, this is a 5.5 and that a 4.8 or something. Um, uh, well, and that's almost right, but it's not quite right. Okay. The, the, the right way to challenge students, I believe, is, well, you know, the, the, um, the, the, Netflix, the Netflix challenge. Uh, you know, where you're given a concrete, you're given the data and you're given a concrete problem to solve, and you're measured by how close to a solution you've come. Or, you, know, you can actually measure who's got a solution. And solutions are valuable. Okay. And that's, well, Kaggle competitions are, are, are pretty much all like that. That is, they're, they're actually solving somebody's problem. And that's, I think that's the way we should go. But moreover, um, you know, the major applications of data science are typically experimental. That is, the solutions we come up with are not necessarily the best possible solutions. Uh, we may not even know until we try it how good they are or how bad they are. Uh, um, and, uh, well, as, as it says here, I, 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 I feel that in many applications, <laughs> not all, uh, but m most, most of the time it's more important to try something, get something done, than, uh, than to analyze just how well, uh, how well you're doing. Um, and, and, and by the way, again, I, I, if you're in the stats department here, or Sympathetic to, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for what statisticians do. The best ones are actually functioning very much like computer scientists. And I, you know, my message is not go away. It's join us. Uh, uh, take take computer science seriously and 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 try to make the world better through computer science. Um, so so let, let, let's. You know, talk about you know on, on this this theme of of, of you know it's it's better to do something than to uh, worry about how well you're doing. Okay, let's talk about you know if, if uh, when these these phishing emails uh, if you're using Gmail or or I think pretty much any, any major mail system. Uh, they're not pretty good at catching them and, 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 uh, and, and at least warning you about them. Uh, how good are they? I have no idea. And, and even if I had a good statistical analysis of, of you know, um, uh, of the, the, the false positive and the, and the true negative rates, um, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't apply tomorrow because phishing attacks change. They, they, um, and 
you know, if you consider this uh, a, a, a part of, you know, the Drew Conway's danger zone, uh, you know, uh, well, what it says here, the, the real danger is that if you don't do something, people are going to get suckered in, in, in to, to, to phishing attacks. And, and so you do, you, doing the best you can is more important than providing guarantees or Well, uh, you know, again, I think there are any number of examples here. Um, uh, you know, for, for example, people are now beginning to analyze personal genomes and uh, uh, dis deciding whether, uh, you know, a, a treatment will work for you or not, or what, deciding what treatment uh, to do. You know, and, and you know, there. Uh, Medicine is not, it's, it's not as good as it is on Star Trek. <coughs> uh, you know, but, but we're getting there. And, and you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. You know, and, uh, and it's more important to, to try to, to do something than, than, than to analyze how well we're doing. Uh, uh, predicting hurricanes. Well, you know, if you recently there was a hurricane, uh, they thought it was going to go up the west coast of Florida. They thought it was going to go up the, the east coast of Florida. Actually, went up the west coast of Florida. Not so, you know, not perfect. But at least they knew a hurricane was coming. A hundred years ago, the, the way you knew that a hurricane was coming was the trees started falling. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, there, there are just any number of of, uh, of of examples where. We're using data science, we're using the best tools we have to do the best we can. Okay, now let's take on the machine learning. Okay, now, again, I think machine learning is, is very important. You know, I spent most of my life my, my, uh, poo-pooing everything that went on in AI. I, I, I've stopped doing that. Uh, I mean, this, this, is, this is real. These are important algorithms that are solving uh, real problems. Um, and they tend to do it by creating models of things in, in ways that we really could not do before. Uh, and even the earlier modeling approaches are, are not as good as, as, as the machine learning tools that have been developed. Okay, now, uh, uh, I, I want to just walk you through this. Uh, it, 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 how many people have, have heard of the Gartner, uh, the, the Gartner hype cycle? Okay, the, the idea, what, what this is saying is, uh, with technological ideas, uh, they start off, they, they grow to a peak of, of hype where people are convinced they're going to solve everything and they're going to do everything. It's just going to be the most wonderful uh, thing imaginable. And then it turns out not to meet all of its, its hype. And therefore, it starts sliding down, and people say, oh, gee, you know, this is terrible. It's, it's uh, utterly worth, uh, utterly not worth, worth even thinking about. It's what they call the trough, this disillusionment. Uh, and then people start really trying to understand it, and, and it gets sophisticated about the concept. And this, it does actually solve some problems. And then it, it, it gradually goes up again, where, the, where they, the people are actually solving. Okay, so, um, uh, well, where's machine learning? In, in, in 2015, I don't, know if, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it was just a little bit past the peak of hype. By, by the way, um, the reason I started out with 2015 was in 2014, they didn't know that machine learning existed. <laughs> it doesn't even appear on the diagram. Anyway, here's the 2016 diagram. At this point, machine learning has actually gone backwards. <laughs> and it's right at the peak. Uh, what happened in 2017? Well, uh, now you have actually two things sort of right at the top. Right at the, right at the peak is deep learning. <laughs> and machine learning is right next to it. And now it's again slide is just started sliding down. Here it is, 2018. Um, Oddly enough, uh, machine, well, there's one, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but it's, it's at the, right at the peak, it's deep uh, neural nets, parenthesis, deep learning. <laughs> uh, 
uh, machine learning apparently has gone away. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's that. Okay, well, Again, again, I have a lot of respect for the machine learning community, but, but it's not all of data science. Um, and, okay, one thing that bothers me is, um, is that they tend to um, uh, sort of retroactively define some good ideas as, um, uh, as machine learning. Uh, example here, clustering, uh, you know, people are talking about clustering uh, years before there was such a thing as, as, as machine learning. Uh, gradient descent, it sort of kind of comes from uh, Isaac Newton. Uh, uh, association rules, uh, I'll talk, I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. It's just an example. Um, uh, I, mean, I recall a conversation I had with a machine learning guy where, where, where I pointed out uh, locality sensitive hashing as, as an example of something that is not machine learning. And his, his argument was, Gee, but uh, locality sensitive hashing is a really good idea. It must be machine learning. <laughs> 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 um, okay, uh, another thing, of course, is that, that okay, while modeling is very important, it's not the whole story. And then the third thing is that sometimes understandably counts. This is especially true if you're in Europe. Uh, they, they actually have laws now that require uh, models to be understandable. So I'm, I'm going to uh, actually uh, address these in, re in reverse order. Uh, okay, so the, the first thing about understandability, but um, association rules. This was, this was um, uh, uh, mostly Rakesh Agarwal and, and his, uh, his colleagues. Um, I think it was in the late 90s, mid-90s, mid right? Um, association rules are things you discover from data, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, and you normally count co-occurrence of things that appear in baskets. The original idea was, uh, it was called the market basket model. People go to the supermarket, uh, they wheel a shopping cart full of stuff, and uh, the cash registers would record how uh, you know, what you bought together. And they would discover things like if you buy bread, you're very likely to buy butter also. Uh, um, well, just to give you, give you an ex example of how it might be used in, in practice, let's talk about phishing attacks again. Uh, now, in this case, uh, the baskets are let's say, our, our emails, uh, you can, each email consists of a set of words. And what you want to find is words that occur together in many uh, uh, phishing attacks. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, if, if an email uh, has the words Nigerian and Prince, it's probably a phishing uh, Well, the fact is, that association rules um, don't do as, uh, as well as, as even s as simple machine learning uh, models. Um, you know, just for, you know, for example, if you try to learn a, a weight on each word, um, uh, and, uh, and let's say you're you know, using some, some sort of a perceptron, uh, you just say that it's fishing if, if the sum of the weights is, is positive and, and not fishing if, 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 it, if it's negative. Uh, I mean, that will work a little bit better than an association rule based system. There's no, no question about that. But, okay, uh, I think you can understand the association rules. If I, if I you know, um, well, you can read this. Um, okay, you can explain to the Nigerian prince why their emails are winding up in spam. <laughs> because he, there's this rule that says if you say you're a Nigerian prince, it's going to be, we're going to call it spam. Uh, I don't know how many people have done this. I, I, every once in a while, I, I'll, I'll take a look at a spam, and, and I'm curious why Google uh, put it into my spam folder. Sometimes it'll say, well, it's 
because you marked other messages from the sources <coughs> as spam. But most of the time, what it, it says is something like this. Uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, because we think it's spam. <laughs> uh, and what that means is there's some mysterious model, a model which I'm sure is a very sophisticated thing, uses lots of statistics and lots of mathematics. Uh, but they've got a model, and you know, it's going to decide. And, and that's all they can really tell you about it. Uh, uh, not, not too bad. I mean, we know that Google and all, uh, all of the, the email processors, they do a pretty good job at, at identifying spam. Um, so I'm not too, uh, you know, not going to worry too much about it. Uh, on the other hand, insurance companies are using models now to rate the, your premium, to decide how much uh, you should pay for medical insurance or automobile insurance or something. Uh, and uh, you know, they have the, you know, they've got a, they, they might change their model. You might discover that your premium has gone up because somehow. The model has decided that you are like other people who are big risks. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you can't understand the model, if the model is, uh, you know, a thousand node convolutional neural network or something, you know, you know, the only thing I can say is, well, because you look like other people that you think are risks. Uh, not, not a, not a, not a very happy situation. Um, so, I'm going to say, okay, you should <coughs> use machine learning. First of all, obviously, you ha a, a machine learning gives you a model. Okay, so it's got to be something that requires a model. Um, and there's no need to explain what your model is doing. Um, and, and but there's a, there's another uh, another important point, which is. It has to be something that you don't really understand very well. Okay. And I'm thinking, uh, the, in the, the 1990s, we had a couple of, st of, of students uh, at, at Stanford who started a company called Zhang Li. Um, they sold to Amazon, and, and they made a lot of money from it. Uh, one of the students uh, then took their uh, winnings and started a company called Whizbang Labs. Uh, and he actually hired of the top machine learning people of the day were working for him. Uh, and his, his goal was to go on the web, uh, the plan was go on the web, identify pages that were people's resumes, and then they were going to you know, take all of the resumes they could find and use it to help um, employers find the people that they needed. Okay. Well, the fact is that they, they were never able to use machine learning to get a better uh, a better algorithm to, to identify the uh, resumes versus non-resumes than, um, you know, than, than sort of simple uh, you know, non-machine learning uh, tricks. Because the, the problem is, it, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you have a resume online. Uh, <coughs> if not, you will soon. Uh, once you've written a resume, you, know, you, you get a template. You, you Take a you know, look at some friend's resume. They all kind of look the same. They have the same words, you know, uh, uh, employment positions held and so on. It's it's pretty easy to tell a resume without doing any machine learning. And and, and so they, they went bankrupt, uh, just trying to, to, to solve a problem that could be solved easily by other means. That's not to say that there aren't problems that really do need machine learning. This just wasn't one. Um, well, the, the, the last point is that there are important data, uh, data science problems that don't involve uh, models. And, and I just want to, just to give you a little bit of technical, uh, uh, technical part of the talk, uh, I wanted to, to talk about two of them, and, and, and these, are, these, are, these are two of my favorites. Uh, we're talking about locality sensor hashing and, and, and uh, approximate counting. Um, I, 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 uh, I don't know, if, if, if you haven't seen it, uh, you can learn about these in, in much more detail than I can describe here. Um, the, free, the free online book, uh, the, the www.mmdfminingofmassivedatacenters.org. Um, you're welcome to, to, to grab a copy if you haven't. 
Uh, and there's also a move based on the book by the same, uh, the, same uh, the authors, the three of us, uh, are, are featured in the, uh, the MOOC. Um, I'm not expecting you to remember this, but if you, if you just Google MMDS MOOC at Stanford or something, uh, you'll get it. Okay, so locality sensitive hashing. Uh, the typical use is one where, uh, where you have to compare each pair of items from some large set. And, and the problem is the set doesn't have to be too large before the number of pairs becomes kind of astronomical and becomes the bottleneck. Okay, it's just to, to look at each pair of, well, uh, of a million items, there are just too many of them. I mean, I guess you could, you could do it, you know, you, you just rent enough, uh, enough nodes from, uh, from AWS or something and, and, and you can get it done these days, but, but it's, it's, it's pretty painful. And, and, um, I, I want to just, just give a, a very simple example of locality sensitive hashing, uh, uh, it's called entity resolution. Uh, the, very often you try to match records uh, that refer to the same person, uh, possibly in, in a pool of records or, or from um, different sources. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and looking, at, looking at records and trying to decide whether they refer to the, the same person can be a little bit tricky. You know, okay, if they have the same name, that's a clue. Right. But there are people with the same name. There are different people. Uh, and moreover, sometimes you'll have a record where your name is misspelled, or um, you use your middle name in one record and, and it's not there in the other record. So the names are different, but they are the same person. Uh, and I, you know, as, as I said, if, if you have a million records, uh, there are half a trillion <coughs> comparisons. So, you know, you could, these days, you could probably make half a trillion comparisons with enough, uh, uh, enough compute power, but it's, um, uh, but, but it, it, it's much more painful, uh, but it takes much more resources than you'd really uh, think, think should be necessary. Um, and uh, again, this, the problem is not a model. Now, by the way, you might even argue that, well, yeah, the model is in what makes two records the same. And you could actually, you could actually build a model of that. Fact, that turns out not to be very important. Uh, but it's not the computational bottleneck. The bottleneck, again, is, is in doing the comparisons in the same way. Um, so what you want to do is you have to compare uh, you know, members of a, of a set of n records. Uh, you, you want to get better than quadratic performance. And um, locality sensitive hashing lets you do that as long as you're willing to accept a few false negatives. That is, you might fail to, to identify some pairs that actually do refer to the same person. Um, and the, the, the more resources you put at the problem, of course, the fewer false positives there will be, but they never go away completely. Um, so, Again, the locality sensor is a, it's a much broader theory, but just, just in, in this particular application. What you want to do is, you, it, in, in general, you, you need to find a collection of hash functions, not just one, but, but several hash functions. And you want each hash function hashes all the items. Again, say we're talking about a million items, so hashing a million items, uh, let's say using 10 different hash functions, it's not anything like um, uh, a million squared uh, work. Uh, but so, so we're going to use each hash function <coughs> to throw the items into the buckets. And this is, uh, of course, where it's sometimes hard to believe that you, you can do this. You want to make sure that if the items are similar, then they're, there's, they're, there's a good chance they're going to wind up in the same bucket. And if they are not similar, then they and almost certainly not to wind up in the same bucket. <coughs> and then, you know, as I said, you'll have several hash functions. Could be 10, 100. In my example, it would be, I think, three. Uh, but 
Uh, but the idea is that, that you will only compare two items, run whatever test you're doing to, to, to see whether they refer to the same person, uh, if they have wound up in the same bucket at least once. Okay. So the idea is if they're similar, each of the hashings gives you a good chance of finding them in the same bucket. You, if you do the hash several times, you have an even better chance that they will at least once wind up in the same bucket. So you'll probably test them for similarity. And if they are really similar, you will in fact learn that. Uh, and then what you want to know is if they're not similar, there's a good chance none of the hashings will put them in the same bucket, and therefore you never have to compare them. Okay, and that's that's what is, that's what gets you below the n squared or running running time. Um, so you know, for example, um, uh, assuming the records in are are about people, we have one hash function which just hash based on a name. So if this if two records have the same name, then uh, they will wind up in the same bucket. Uh, if they have different names, they will not. So you'll capture at least those pairs of records where the names are identical. If, again, if one record is missing the middle name or, or there's a misspelling or something, uh, you won't capture that. But you have other chances to capture uh, the record. So you might, uh, uh, again, hash based on phone numbers. So you put, um, uh, you, you put records in the same bucket if and only if they have the same phone number. Again, that will that will capture people, you know, if they have the same phone number. But it might be, let's say, uh, uh, spouses use the same phone number. Remember when people had landlines, you would actually be sharing phone numbers. Uh, I guess nobody does that anymore. Uh, uh, you know, there'll be typos <coughs> in phone numbers. So, uh, you know, so you might have two records where, where the phone number should have been the same, but but they're not. Uh, and then you might, you know, run on addresses and uh, <coughs> social security numbers if you've got that. So, so, so you just, for any any, um, any field of the records that uh, that that have have the, the property that if if the records do refer to the same person, then there's a good chance that they're uh, that the val the field will have the same value, and if the records refer to different people, the chances are very small that they'll have the same value uh, is, is, is a suitable candidate for, for this kind of locality sense of hash. Um, okay. Well, and, you know, as I said, if the, the whole idea is um, uh, you know, with this, so this sort of a scheme, what you would expect is that if two records represent the same person, <coughs> at least one of these fields will be the same. And uh, if they represent different people, there's a good chance, really good chance, that, that, that they, they won't agree in any of the fields. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, you know, because there are going to be some false, uh, false positives so far, uh, you know, for example, two people that have actually the same name, I mean, there are people that have the same name, but they're really different people, uh, uh, being in the same bucket only makes you a candidate. You have to actually look at, at each pair that appears in a bucket together and, and check whether they really are likely to be the same person, which typically means the, all the fields are more or less the same, or most of the fields are, are, are more or less the same, uh, maybe with some small typos or uh, you know, differences like well, it's kind of the same name, not quite, but uh, but there's a misspelling or, or a middle name is missing in one of the cases. Uh, so you have to, again, there is a little bit of judgment that has to go into the question of, um, of what, uh, should I say, yes, these are the, these records are the same person or not. Okay. Uh, so, um, the second thing I want to talk about you know, is this, is this uh, algorithm for <coughs> approximate counting. Uh, and uh, like locality sense of hashing, it's not a perfect scheme, but it, it's, it's a very efficient way to approximate how many different items you appear in a stream or a data set. Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, Facebook is always reporting how many visitors did we have in a month. 
how many different visitors. Now, many people log on many, many times. You don't want to just count logins because that won't tell you how many unique users there, there, there were. Um, well, can, it's easy to solve this problem. Um, I mean, what Facebook could simply do is keep a hash table uh, and uh, when a, a user logs on, you uh, hash them to the, to the table. If they're already there, you just ignore it. If they're not there, you increase the count of unique users by one, and you add them to the table. Okay. Uh, well, you know, Facebook, I mean, uh, they just reported earnings. I think they uh, claim 1.7 billion unique users in a month. Uh, so the table is going to be kind of big. It doesn't matter. Facebook has lots and lots of do this. Um, but what I want to talk about next is an example where the, uh, uh, the, the problem requires uh, <coughs> counting not just one thing, but, but m many things. So much that even though each hash table is rather small, it's um, the number of hash tables you have to count, which I would claim is around a trillion. Uh, it just makes it, uh, it's kind of unrealistic uh, to use the naive solution. Okay, so, so here, here's, here's the problem. Um, if you're crawling the web, you get an index of, 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 uh, of, of the web. Um, you actually have to be selected. Even Google doesn't go everywhere in the web. So they'll start from some initial set, I don't know, probably something like the home pages of universities. And they'll go out for, I don't know, 10 or 12 hops. And that will get you pretty much any place that's important in the web. Remember, uh, they're going to, uh, uh, you know, Google is, you know, they're going to say, well, your search query was matched by 100 million pages, but here are the top 10. And that's really all you care about. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, once they've gone out to a sufficient, you know, they may, have, they may have, let's say, visited a trillion pages. But there's lots more to the web that they haven't seen yet. Yet it's probably mostly unimportant. But, but they're, they're going to still explore a little further, but they're going to prioritize the important pages. If you don't have a high page rank, the chances that you're actually going to be the answer to anybody's search query, at least the answer that they will or look at uh, is very, very small. So, so what you want to do is visit the high page rank <coughs> pages. But uh, the trouble is you can't compute the page rank if you don't know the entire uh, transition matrix of, of the web. And while you're crawling, you don't know that yet. Okay. So um, a simple approximation is just count the number of times the page has been reached from the part of the web that you've crawled already. And, and that's probably good enough. Um, so what we want to do is count the number of distinct predecessor pages. Uh, and you want to do it for each, each page that, that, that you haven't crawled yet but might want to crawl. And again, there could be trillions of these pages. Uh, so I want, to, I want to get a count of distinct predecessors. but. I said an approximation is fine. I mean, the, the whole, the, you know, you're approximating the page rank anyway, so why not just approximate the count? Uh, you just, you're just taking a guess. Probably nobody will ever see any of this anyway. <coughs> Quick question? Yes. What service are you reaching and crawling? Um, oh, well, well, you reach a page, you know it exists. The crawler, you have to look at it and see what links there are on the page. So like past it? Well, yeah, okay. Go right. past it. That's fair. <coughs> Sorry. Good point. Okay. Um, okay. So the flagellate Martin algorithm. Uh, the way the way you estimate the count of predecessors is you keep a number of variables, what they call variables, and a hundred might be a reasonable count for the number of, of variables. Each is a small integer. <coughs> By small, I mean really small. Four bits or maybe five bits is is enough. So if I have let's say four bit integers um, and uh, hundred variables, that's fifty bytes. Okay. 
So um, 50 bytes per, in, uh, 50 bytes will now substitute for the hash table, for, for, for one of the trillion uh, hash tables. So we're still talking, I mean, this is still a huge problem. We're talking about 50 terabytes. Uh, but again, if you're Google, you, 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 you got that. Uh, okay. Now, a variable is, is associated with a hash function. And um, for each variable, you're going <coughs> to... Uh, you're going to hash the input. Let's say a user, uh, the user, if, you, if this is the Facebook uh, problem, uh, uh, counting distinct users, you just hash the username to a bit string. And uh, uh, the tail length of a bit string is simply the number of consecutive zeros at the end. And the value of the variable v is the largest tail length you've seen so far. Uh, hashing all of the inputs that you've seen. Okay. So if you have four bits, you can count up to um, two to the. Uh, you you can count up to sixteen, or to, count up to fifteen, uh, and um, and that's probably enough for, for these applications. Uh, now, the idea behind the, the flashily marked algorithm, and by the way, this is a very interesting application of mathematics and statistics, uh, is it, uh, if, if, you, if, 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 if it's the largest tail length is r, then it's going to estimate that you've seen two of the r different values. And this kind of makes sense. Now, the, again, if, uh, I encourage you to read the whole story in the MMDS book because it's not nearly that simple. But, but, but here's, here's sort of the intuition. Uh, if I've seen two to the R different values, then there's a good chance that I've seen any different, any particular sequence of R bits at the end of some hash value. The, the actual probability is 1 minus 1 over E. Or, uh, <coughs> 69%. Um, so, uh, in particular, if I wanted to see R0, the chances are fairly good that I've seen, um, uh, again, if, if I've seen two of the R different values, there's a pretty good chance I will have seen a, a tail length of, of R. Uh, if I've seen many fewer than two of the R different values, then the chances are very small that I will have seen uh, R0 as a tail well, again, to make a long story short, you need to combine the estimates that you get from this, say, 100 different variables, uh, and you have to do that in the right way in, in order uh, to know that the more variables you use, the closer you're going to get to the actual um, estimate of the actual number of distinct <coughs> elements that, that you've seen. So let me just, just to you know, uh, uh, restate the obvious. Uh, um, okay, again, I think I see data science as a, a, a the evolution of work that's been going on for decades in computer science, uh, in attempting to apply what we know to um, uh, to, to other other people's applications. Uh, again, the statisticians, as I said, they, they, they almost got it right, but the big problem that I see is that they focus <coughs> too much on the analysis, on playing with the data rather than solving the problem. And then the last thing, you know, machine learning, I, I recognize, is a big part of what goes on in data science, but it's not the only thing you have. With that, I will take questions and arguments. Before we do that, one quick thing. Uh, some of you may have to leave because we're class starting, and you do need that code. So the code is, I guess, data, everything lowercase.
Yeah, but there's only a pen here, otherwise I would do it. And in the meantime, while I erase and figure out how to do this, you can continue with the questions. Do you need Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Not science, it's just data. Because after all, Jeff has told us the answer is data. <coughs> First of all, thank you, Professor, for the brilliant talk. And my question is that, uh, what do you think a good data science education program should offer? Like, should it should it be a mixture of selected selected courses from computer science and data statistics, or uh, should it be some special courses designed for data science? Because in my experience, some of the courses just throw several formulas at you and then teach you how to use Python and Pandas. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably okay for a low level data science. First of all, to, you know, a, every computer scientist should take courses in statistics. No question about that. They should take courses in mathematics. Um, uh, uh, multivariable calculus. You know, I when we designed our original computer science program at Stanford, we required multivariable calculus and linear algebra, and like, just because we wanted to torture us. <laughs> Uh, turns out those are both very important subjects. Everybody needs to know that. Okay. Um, but uh, again, as I, I said in one of the slides, I think you want to be a data scientist, enroll in the computer science department, take the regular required courses, and when you have options, take courses like database systems, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, things that deal with the, with the big data <coughs> That's my humble opinion. Uh, I do not believe that there's any reason to have a Department of Data Science or a special degree in, in data science. Um, again, as, as, as you said, uh, learning how to use Python libraries is not enough. Okay? Not, uh, probably there are people for whom that is a useful education, but it's not a real data science. problems and using data science to solve these bigger problems. A lot of the problems, um, especially when you have to do with uh, things that touch communities like civil infrastructures and you're getting lots of data today because there's a lot of the IoT devices supplying this data. This kind of analysis needs to be done in a very short period of time. Um, not perfectly, approximately. Um, where do you see machine learning being a part of that kind of quick and dirty analysis? Um, well, uh, again, a lot of the machine learning that goes on really uses massive amounts of hardware and will run for a, a week. I think that's really what you're concerned about. Um, yeah, you, you can, if, if that's what's really involved, where you're learning a model matter of seconds, I, I don't think that that's a realistic application today, probably never will be. Uh, but, but that tends to be not how it works. I mean, look, look at, you know, let's say driverless cars, where, where you really have that sub-second decision-making process. Uh, presumably, they have machine learning algorithms that are done offline, and maybe, you know, <coughs> maybe they run for a week, I don't know. And then they load that into the into the, 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 the car, and they're, you know, what's important is that you be able to apply the model to what you're seeing now and do that uh, at, at sub-second speeds. And, that, you know, depending on how the model works and how much hardware you put into it, in uh, many cases that's quite feasible. No, but uh, but I, I haven't heard of applications where where you're actually uh, building models in, in, in real time, essentially. Unless, unless you have a particular example in mind. No, I I'll, 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 bet, I'll bet you're worried about something in particular and you don't want to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be meeting your two things on but uh, I think a lot of, uh, there's value to having models, but sometimes they don't work and they give you a lot of false positives. And false negatives too, which could have implications on safety. And so
other questions? Okay, well, I, if not, I have a two-part question. Yeah. So first, in the Gartner hype cycle that you showed, I did not see the word data science there, or did I miss it? Um, Should it be there somewhere? It was there in the previous year, I know. Okay, all right. Is it at the top, where is it at the peak, or is it at the, is mm -hmm. that? Well, if I recollect, it was sort of going off. So it's still on the way up. Cool. Cool. Yeah, but that was 14, right? 2014. I see. So the other it, has, it has not appeared. I don't think that it's, it appears in any of the uh, the ones that I showed. Yeah, I did not notice that there. Yeah. So I think the second part is um, whenever a new area comes, a new thought process comes, it produces new problems. So maybe I should may I want to switch the question around. So yes, computer science has a lot to offer, and obviously through data science and so on. But given this problems that exist, or there has it in changed computer science, and what are the new emerging things that in CS? that you see which are coming in, which we should be either teaching or we should be either sort of researching, which comes from this particular use of computer science. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the general thing that we should be aware of as far as, as curriculum is concerned is that we have finally become more applications than core, way more applications than core. <laughs> Is the bank going to make me an offer? <laughs> uh, no. Um, uh, you know, that is, I, mean, I think it was, I don't know, around 1980, there was the Hartmanis Report. <laughs> 27,000. <000. laughs> um, you know, I think it was called um, Expanding. But the, the, the idea was that computer scientists shouldn't just be worried about compilers and operating systems and so on, but, but should be worried about uh, applications to, uh, to to other fields. Uh, and this was the 1980s. Uh, and this has finally come true. Okay. That is, we are much more about um, uh, 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 about taking computer science and using it to solve other people's problems than we are about solving our own problems. Uh, <coughs> obviously, that's still, you know, uh, the, the internal work hasn't decreased, but it has become a much smaller part of, of what we're doing. And therefore, uh, curricula have to be tailored to at least make possible uh, an education that is mostly applied externally. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, I have a question for the uh, LCS algorithm. Mm -hmm. Show this one first. LSH. So, um, LSH. Sorry. Um, so you said that we should use different hash functions um, to uh, for different fields and. Uh, my question is, uh, for different hash functions, shouldn't they hash to a different bucket each time? Oh, yes. Yeah, <coughs> right. Yes, you're bucketizing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's, that's very important. Each hash function has its own set of buckets. Oh, um, so let's say uh, hash function one uh, hashes this name field into bucket one. Yeah. Then hash function two will, will also hash this same name to bucket one. No, no, no. Well, no, no. The hash function two doesn't look at the name; it looks at something else, oh. say the address. Oh, so different hash functions are for different fields. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, again, that's for the very particular kind of locality-sensitive hashing that I talked about, where what you're hashing are records with fields. Okay. Um, uh, again, if you read the MMDS book, there are uh, lots of other applications where the Hash functions are completely different and totally <coughs> related to fields of records. So in the oh one last we Praveen has been raising his hand too many times. Sorry, that's the last question. And uh, then you thank you for thank the talk. Um, do you feel like computer science research is sort of shifting from uh, what we use the term as core research to a more application driven research where uh, essentially there's a lot more engineering involved than what we consider like pure research. 
that I'm, I'm, I'm not. In the sense of. It sounds uh, like a couple of, couple of different yeah. issues here. Right? Like, uh, the thing that I'm most wondering about is is there more um, engineering that's going to be involved in what we consider research going forward, especially in the field of computer science, uh, applied to other fields? Um, well, I think there's always been, a, first of all, you know, if something calls itself a science, it isn't. Um, and I've always thought of computer science as a branch of engineering. Uh, and there's engineering in compiler design. There's also engineering in applying machine learning. And it's equally, uh, it's equally engineering as far as I'm concerned. It's a different kind of engineering, just like civil engineering is different from mechanical engineering. Uh, but, um, and I, I would not say, uh, you know, so, so, so yeah, so it's all, it's all basically engineering. Uh, uh, again, and, and I don't want to imply that the core has gone away. It hasn't. But relative to the activity in applications, it now looks like a smaller thing. But it's, it's really sort of the same size it's always. the applications that, that have grown. A lot of the applications now are what you classify as data science. But there are also applications there that are, are not data science. Again, uh, things like you know, driverless cars or, or, uh, or machine translation or uh, robotics. You know, sort of fundamental tools that every application or many applications would want to use. So let us thank Jeff again for a thought-provoking talk.